Right on. Thank you, Lindsay. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer, and I'm the park interpreter in Spruce Woods Provincial Park, which resides on Treaty 1 territory, home of the Anishinaabe, the Dakota, and the Métis Nation. And I'm really glad you guys have all joined me here today to learn all about our wild babies. And these are going to be all of our wild animals that are coming around this spring. So I'm going to go through this wonderful PowerPoint with you guys and hopefully you guys can learn some wonderful information about what you can do to help our wild babies. All right, so with the incoming warm weather, we're going to be starting to see signs of new life. So we're going to see new plants starting to grow, the leaves are starting to bud and our baby wildlife are starting to make their appearances. Now over the years, many of our young wildlife have mistakenly been identified as orphans and members of the public in their concern have unknowingly kidnapped these baby animals from their natural parents. Now luckily, most of them can be placed back into their natural habitat, but by learning about the natural history of infant wildlife, we can reduce the number of animals that are brought into wildlife rehab centers and conservation offices. So let's talk about the baby birds. So this is going to be a poll question. We're gonna pop it up here. It's gonna be our first question of the webinar today. And we'll see if Lindsay can get that going for us. Let's see, how are you doing, Linz? There it is, true or false. If you touch a baby bird, you will put your scent on it and the mom will reject the baby. So on your screen there, you can check off true or false and let me know what you guys think. All right, and the answer here, let's so, ooh, this is interesting. So 47% of you believe that this is true and 50% or sorry, 53% believe it's false. So I'm gonna go back to my presentation here and we will continue on and I will answer that for you. So this is actually false. It's actually a complete myth. Birds have a terrible sense of smell. So they're actually not going to smell a human on the baby bird. So if you were to see a baby bird on the ground and you were to touch it, you're actually not putting them in any danger because the mom can't actually smell you on the baby. So it is okay. So let's learn a little bit more about these baby birds. All right, so newly born birds are called hatchlings and they kind of look like these naked little aliens and their eyes are fully closed. Now hatchlings are under three days old and you may see that they have little wisps of down on their body and they're definitely not ready to leave the nest. Now nestlings and fledglings are the next two stages of baby birds life. So a nestling is usually between three to 13 days old and their eyes are open. They may have bald patches kind of on their body and their wing feathers kind of look like these little tubes or like little quills because they've yet to break through these protective sheaths that are around them. And nestlings are unable to stand, perch or hop and they're definitely not ready to leave the nest. Whereas a fledgling, these guys are about 13 to 14 days old or older. They have feathers, but they're very short on both the wings and the tail. You can still see some down feathers popping through their feathers, which kind of makes them look a little bit like Einstein. And they also still have these gape flanges, which are basically kind of on the outer sides of their beak. There's a soft fleshy, fleshy region where their beaks join together. So these guys you'll see hopping around, they can hold themselves up easily and their parents are going to be nearby. So why is it important for you guys to know the difference between a nestling and a fledgling? Well, it's important to tell them apart because sometimes these infant birds were gonna, are falling from their nests, especially on windy days. Knowing if these are nestlings or fledgling will, be ter will determine what you're going to do with that bird. If these birds are nestlings, they should be placed back into the nest if possible. You simply have to look up into the nearest tree and try and find the nest as the nestlings couldn't have fallen too far. 
Now, if the nest is too high up, you can create a substitute nest. So this can be made out of like margarine containers. You just have to poke holes in the bottom for drainage because you don't want to turn it into like a pool. Um, you want to line it with twigs and grass. And if the original nest has been destroyed, you could even use like parts of that as your substitute nest. And remember that the nest is going to be exposed to rain and dew. So make sure you keep that in mind when you're choosing that nesting material that you're going to put within it. You want to also put the nest as close as possible to the original nest. And you want to make sure that it's very tightly secured to the tree because the parent bird is going to be perching on the edge of that and has to be able to support their body weight. And you also want to make sure that it's sheltered from the sun and the rain and predators if possible. You can also use other containers such as small berry containers, baskets, or even hanging flower pots. And you want to keep in mind when you're choosing these alternate nests that they are similar in size and shape to the original. Um, so it should be large enough to contain the growing baby birds, but small enough that they each fit snugly in it as they grow. And it's okay if you have the original nest and a substitute nest because the parent birds will still feed both nests. Now, after you put the nestlings back into the nest, you should make sure that you monitor it because if the nestling is pushed out again, then what could be happening is an intentional brood reduction, which means the mom is purposely booting that baby out of there. She can't handle it. She doesn't want it. So if that does happen more than twice where the baby is ejected from the nest, um, if the nestling is out twice, then you want to make sure that you can pick up that little baby bird and contact a wildlife rehab center. It's important to keep in mind, though, that nestlings are very difficult to raise in captivity. They have to be fed every 15 minutes during daylight hours. And if they miss any of their feedings, they can develop deformities or feather abnormalities. So these guys require a lot of intensive care, and it is, causes a lot of restrictions in the amount of these little baby birds that can come into wildlife rehab centers. So it's really important to note that if you can put these guys back into the nest, and you can you know, make sure that they're back with their parents, they have a way better chance of survival. Now, our little fledglings are a different story. So you would not wanna put a fledgling back into the nest. And this is because before they fly, fledglings are gonna jump out of the nest and they're gonna spend a few days on the ground. And this is a time for our fledglings to sharpen their foraging skills and they practice takeoffs from the ground. And these guys are pretty awkward looking. And so they can be mistaken for like adults with wing injuries because they kind of suck at doing their flying skills, right? Maybe they're not doing such great attempts here. So it's a perfectly normal stage of development. They're not injured. They're just awkward and learning how to fly. And the only time you should be helping a fledgling is if you see a visible sign of injury. So maybe they have like a really droopy wing or they have some blood somewhere on them or they're having really difficulty um, time standing. And the parents with fledglings, they're going to swoop down about once an hour to feed them. So you don't have to worry that they're left alone. The parents are still around and are still feeding the babies. Um, and unless you're watching them like a hawk, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, you will practically miss it when the mom and dads come down and feed the babies. But there are other ways you guys can help these fledglings. So you can make sure that if you happen to have any pets that you keep them indoors. You know, if you happen to have a fledgling in your backyard, maybe take your dog for a walk in the front yard to go outside um, and maybe encourage your neighbors to do the same if it's in the neighborhood. Remember that all of these birds have a better chance of surviving and living a normal life in the wild with their natural parents. Humans cannot teach these birds how to sing or recognize alarm calls or how to forage for food. Only their parents can do that. Now, if you find a bird that has hit a window, you can place it in a small shoe box or a small box that it fits into um, and make sure it has a soft, uh, you know, non-fraying towel on the bottom, has some air holes, and you want to put that box into a warm, quiet, dark area for a couple of hours, at which point you can take the lid off. And if the bird, uh, the bird will usually fly away on its own. It just needs to kind of recover. Um, however, if it cannot fly or it doesn't even try to attempt to fly, then you want to contact a wildlife rehab center. Now, to prevent window strikes from happening, you can do a few things. You can put up wind socks, you could put up like sheer garbage bags or, you know, like ribbons. You can um, put up wind chimes or you can even put up falcon silhouettes onto your window. All right, I have another poll question coming up. So here's the next poll question. Let's see if I can get this one popping up. Need like background music. Do, 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 do. 
Mm -hmm. There it is. Next question. This is the first one. We're gonna go to the next poll question. Do, 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 go back to the music. It's coming, don't worry. Here it is, poll question number two. What is the number one cause of bird deaths in Canada? Do you think it is power line collisions and electrocutions? Collisions with houses or buildings, domestic and feral cats, or vehicle collisions. Take a guess, submit. What do you think? Tell me your thoughts. And once we have totaled all of these, and you guys can see me, hi. As we total all of these, that's gonna pop back up on the screen when we get all your answers. And we can see how it goes. Oh, here we go. All right. So we have 50% thinking collisions with houses or buildings, 36% domestic and feral cats, and 14% of you think vehicle collisions. Very interesting. All right. Well, let's go back to the video here and I will tell you. All right. So the answer is coming in two seconds when I hit the next button. It's still coming. There it is. It's cats, actually. Predation by domestic cats is the number one direct human caused threat to birds in Canada. And in total, uh, cats are estimated to kill between 100 and 350 million birds per year, with a majority likely being killed by feral cats. And this is estimated to suggest that about two to 7% of birds in Canada, in Southern Canada, are killed by cats every year. Um, so the thing to keep in mind too is like even well-fed domestic cats will hunt and kill. We can see that because you know watch them play with a feather toy or a laser. They are always practicing their hunting techniques. So when we allow our cats outdoors, the results are really really deadly for our birds and other small wildlife. And unfortunately, even the mere presence of having a cat outdoors is enough to cause significant impacts to our birds because birds can recognize cats as a threat. Even their presence near a nesting bird will, has been actually shown to reduce the health of the chicks and decrease the nest success. So even a small puncture wound from a cat's claw can introduce bacteria that will kill a small songbird in as little as 48 hours. And the shock of being mauled can also be of serious concern. So if you do see any bird that has been interacting with a cat, you should keep that bird and bring it into a wildlife rehab center where they can give it antibiotics to try and fight off a bacterial infection. And the ecological dangers are so critical that the IUCN, which stands for the International Union for Conservation of Nature, actually lists domestic cats as one of the world's worst non-native invasive species. So ways that you guys can help is if you do happen to have cats, um, you can keep your cat on a leash when you're outside and keep them on, under observation. We all want our animals to be able to enjoy the outdoors, of course, as well. So we can just make sure we do it in a safe manner. We can also get these really cool cat cages that you can set up and your cat can hang outside for hours. I just realized that this one on the left has a parrot on top. So I mean, hey, apparently you can put your cats and your parrots together in a cage. Another thing too is by the way, you can neuter your cat as well. And that's really neuter and spaying your cats is very important. All right, so let's talk about crows. So from early June until mid July, it's very common to find fledgling crows on the ground and it's quite normal. Um, so crows will leave the nest before they fly and their parents will come and feed them on the ground just like our songbirds. Now, again, fledgling crows are often mistaken for injured adult crows because they're super awkward on the ground and they may appear to be like injured looking, but in most cases, they're pretty much just fine. So how do you know you have a, a fledgling crow? You can identify them because they have short tails. They'll be less than two inches. And you'll also notice that they have blue eye color. So um, that's another thing to keep in mind. And usually you have to get kind of close to see that blue eye color. And then the other indicator knowing that this is gonna be a fledgling crow is when you go to look and see, does it have blue eyes? The mom in the tree is gonna start calling at you. Um, so then you'll know, okay, there's a crow that's calling at me pretty hardcore right now. Then you know that the mom is around. Um, so these guys, you can just leave alone unless there is a, again, you know, an injury that is very readily apparent. Now let's talk about bunnies. So another baby to see in the spring and even through the summer are baby cottontail rabbits. Now these guys are very common. You can find them in the city, you can find them in the country, you can find them in your backyard, your front yard. They're all over the place. 
So every year, cottontail rabbits are born and they're born with a very fine coat of hair and they're blind. And their eyes will start to begin to open at about four to seven days. And then they get to move out of the nest for short trips at about two weeks of age and are completely weaned and independent by four to five weeks of age. So if you see a baby bunny that is larger than a softball, then that means that it is fully independent of its mother and can be left alone. And many, peop many people, sorry, will come across um, rabbit nests when we're raking or we're mowing our lawns. And that's because they make uh, their nest in urban areas and like just shallow depressions in the ground, which is lined with fur. So if you see a nest that has not been damaged and the babies aren't injured, just simply leave them alone and don't touch them. Maybe, you know, a lot of times people come across them when they're mowing the lawn, just simply like leave it alone. Maybe don't mow for a couple of weeks until the babies are out and about. Sometimes people are concerned though when they see these nests and then they don't see the mom tending to the nest throughout the day, but that's perfectly normal because the moms will only feed the babies twice a day, usually at dusk and dawn. And then otherwise the mom is gonna stay away from the babies to protect them from predators. And the babies are actually born without scent. So they do not have smell on them. So predators can't sniff them out. So it's best to just leave them alone. And that's what the mom does. Mom will actually just leave them alone. Um, and because they're born without any scent, it's extremely important that humans do not handle the bunnies. So this is different from those baby birds. You do not want to touch baby bunnies with your hands because once we do touch baby bunnies, we put our human scent onto the bunnies and now they're exposed to the chance of being smelled out by a predator. Now, if you're still worried that the mom has not been uh, at the nest and you just wanna be like 100,000% sure that the bunnies are being fed, you can put four pieces of wool into like a tic-tac-toe pattern over top of the nest and you just leave it overnight. And if you go check it the next morning and none of the strings have been moved, then you could be like, okay, maybe the babies weren't fed during the night. And then in that case, you wanna contact a wildlife rehab center before you do anything like touching the babies. Do not touch those babies. Um, and again, this should only be done contacting wildlife rehab or, you know, taking these next steps if you're for sure that these babies are orphaned or maybe you see a dead adult rabbit nearby, right? And that could be a reason of concern to think that they might be orphaned. So unless there's an obvious injury, we always want to leave the bunny alone. However, if you have witnessed the bunny being attacked by a cat, similar to those birds, you wanna make sure that you bring it into a rehab center right away. Similar to baby birds, even the tiny puncture from a claw or a tooth is going to be fatal to the bunny unless we treat it right away. And another thing to keep in mind is that baby rabbits are so stressed. They have a very low survival rate in captivity. And these guys um, really need to just have their best chance of survival being out in the wild with their mothers and their natural parents. And remember, do not handle them. Like this person's holding it, don't do that. All right, so let's talk about our ducklings. So there's a few easy steps on what to do if you suspect that ducklings have been orphaned. If you've been observing a group of ducklings that are bigger than five, and you've been watching them a while, and you notice that there's no mom around, what you can do is pretty easy. You just put um, ducklings into an open box with a shallow pan of water. You can place it in a safe open area for the mom to find. And you can do that for about two hours, unless it's a really hot day, then you don't wanna let them out longer than you know a half an hour. Now, if the mom hasn't returned by then, then you can contact a wildlife rehab center. Now, if there's less than five ducklings and you're unable to find the parents and any of the siblings, then you wanna contact a wildlife rehab center as soon as possible. And it's important to remember that um, our ducklings are different than our songbirds. Our songbirds are born and they're like these naked little aliens and they can't fend for themselves and they rely on their mother for food, right? Ducklings and geese are different. They actually are born with the ability to go and forage for food right away. And they can do that, they can go and forage, but they need their moms to um, protect them and keep them warm. So a small duckling is not able to survive on its own, even though it can forage on its own. So our geese. So orphaned goslings can easily be placed with other geese families. So if you're worried that they might be orphaned, um, obviously you want to contact a wildlife rehab center and they can talk you through the steps. But it's good to know that these guys can actually be placed with other gosling families if they have goslings that are the same size. 
Um, but again, these guys are extremely stressful, like they do not like to be handled. So any wild animal obviously is not gonna wanna be handled. So just keep that in mind. Um, with goslings, you can keep them in a small box with a towel and a heat source. Um, if you're, you know, obviously spoken to the wildlife rehab center and they've talked you through this and you always want to make sure that with goslings, you never want to put water in the box because if they get really stressed out, they may lose their waterproofing and then they can get wet and cold and then they get hypothermia and then they may not make it. So a couple things to keep in mind for the different species. And honestly, just keep in mind as I'm going through this and telling you all these different things, you can always contact a wildlife rehab center. They're excellent contact Manitoba Conservation. They can help you out on who to get a hold of. All right, baby squirrels. So red squirrels can have litters of about three to six hairless young that are born in the spring and early summer. And when they're about five and a half weeks old, the young will start to leave the nest and continue to be fed by the adults. And then by nine weeks old, they're pretty much finding food by themselves. So if you find a baby squirrel and the parents are nearby, just leave them alone. If you suspect that they're being abandoned and they're orphans, you can monitor them for a few hours. And if you're sure the baby does not have a mother nearby, or maybe you see a dead squirrel and you're thinking maybe that's the mother, or you find an injured squirrel, you put it in a cardboard box with air holes in a quiet and warm place and you call a center, a wildlife rehab center. And remember the squirrel will always have a better chance of survival with its parents. Now fawns. Fawns are like our baby bunnies. They are born scent free. Um, and these guys have white camouflage spots which protect them from predators because it allows them to kind of blend in. It's like that dappled sunlight coming into a field. So they blend in well. Um, the doe uh, will continue to keep her baby scent free by consuming their fawn's urine and droppings. So humans should never touch a fawn um, because leaving human scent on their body will attract predators to the fawn. Now, it is extremely natural and normal to find these guys again sitting alone in a field um, as the mom will only stay with the fawn at feeding time. So she generally will leave the fawn alone kind of hanging out by themselves. Only if the mom is known to be dead should you ever contact Manitoba Conservation. So when it comes to deer, you always contact Manitoba Conservation. Deer are not able to be rehabilitated in Manitoba. They do get extremely stressed and they have extremely low survival rates in captivity as well. So we do not rehabilitate deer in Manitoba. Now, bear cubs. I have seen some videos that the bears are out in Manitoba. So you may see the babies coming out too. So bear cubs are actually born in January with the mom in the den and they come out at about three months of age uh, right about now in April and May. And these guys when they come out they're going to be the size of a pug or a beagle and they're going to be chubby fat round balls. That's what we want them to look like. And within the first year these guys are going to grow and they're going to become about the size of a small black lab and they're going to stay with their mother for that first year where they learn their bear skills and they're going to go den together with their mom and then when they emerge the next spring they're going to come out as these like gangly long-legged bears they're like the black lab size or maybe a little bigger and they've got these long skinny legs but those are yearlings and they're you know lab size or bigger and those ones are independent and perfectly okay to be on their own so if you see cubs up in a tree, you want to leave them alone. Um, that's because mom put them up there and she's keeping them safe and she's going to come back later. So that's totally fine. They're, they're doing good. You don't need to bother them. Move on. Now, if you see cubs that look injured, ill or emaciated and they're alone on the ground with no mom around and they're wandering around on the ground, or you know that the mother is deceased, then you wanna keep them in your eye line, you wanna keep them in sight and you wanna contact Manitoba Conservation. Um, we do have a bear sanctuary in Manitoba now, um, but everything goes through Manitoba Conservation. So be sure that if you do come into the situation, you are contacting Manitoba Conservation. So some other spring babies. So pretty much anything else that you see, you wanna make sure you're gonna leave it alone unless it's injured or in danger. Um, these other animals could include woodchucks, muskrats, beavers, bats, foxes, coyotes, you name it. And you never want to handle these animals because there is a risk of rabies, which humans can get from these animals. So if you do happen to come across these animals and you're worried about, you know, injured or orphaned animals, you want to make sure you contact a wildlife rehab center. Now, before I flip this page over to the next one, I need to give you a little bit of information. So I myself used to work for a wildlife rehabilitation center. And I do have experience in this field of work. So here is a picture of myself 
And this is something that actually happened uh, just last year. So my partner and I happened to come across three baby skunks that had fallen into a work hole in my town. And what we did is the babies were uh, okay. So we just basically picked them up, put them into a cardboard box and moved them out of the hole and released them into the bush, which was a safe distance away. I made sure I wore protection for my hands. And yes, I did get skunked by the little guys, <laughs> but if you come across orphan baby skunks, um, you wanna make sure that you're not handling them and you wanna leave them alone in nature. Skunks are always best to be left alone due to their risk of being high vector species for rabies. And skunks are not able to be taken in at any rehab centers here in Manitoba, so they can't go in anywhere to be rehabilitated. Um, if you do have any other concerns regarding skunks, you want to make sure that you always contact Manitoba Conservation. So in this unique scenario, I was just moving them from one location to another so they could go be free in the wild. Um, I would not have ever kept these animals anywhere near me <laughs> beyond that. So some important things to remember. I don't know, I've said things quite repetitively here. So a few of these things you should always remember by the end of it. So first things first, uh, you wanna make sure that you keep your pets away from any injured or orphan wildlife. Um, so if you do happen to you know, take in any of these animals, you wanna make sure that you keep your animal away from the box, like your, your pet away from the injured or orphan wildlife, make sure you keep them away. And, and so that's less stressful for that animal. Um, you also want to make sure that if you do happen to, you know, pack up an animal to be transferred or whatnot, you don't want to feed it. So you should never feed any of these wild animals. Um, animals don't eat the things sometimes that you think they do. So make sure you don't do any of that. And of course, never ever pet these animals because as cute as they are, you are just stressing them out and causing more harm than good. So we want to make sure we don't do any of these three things. And also don't kidnap the babies. And that's the main goal of this entire PowerPoint is to learn how these animals grow and how the animals are, you know, their life stages. So that way we are not unintentionally kidnapping the babies because their greatest chance of survival is always going to be with their parents. And last but not least, I just think it's really important to let everybody know that you should never try to keep these animals at home or try to rehab them yourself. Wild animals are not pets. They do not make good pets. They should never be kept as a pet. Not only is this illegal, they can also carry diseases that can be transferred to humans and they could also become habituated to humans. And habituated animals will never learn how to survive in the wild. They would always come to humans for food and they would be unreleasable. So by learning about the natural history of our infant wildlife and discovering what we can do to help, we can reduce the number of animals that are brought into wildlife rehab centers and conservation offices, and we can let them grow to be healthy wild animals. So here we are, here is the list of the experts. So we are lucky enough to have two wildlife rehabilitation centers in Manitoba. Um, we have the Wildlife Haven um, with their information here on the left, which is 204-878-3740. We also have the Prairie Wildlife Rehabilitation Center at 204-510-1855. And if you see um, any injured orphan wildlife, you can also contact the tip line with Manitoba Conservation, which is also a wonderful option at 1-800-782-0076. So I'm going to keep that going up there. Um, I'll see if we have any questions or anybody has anything they would like to ask and I can go through that. Um, and then at the end, I'll pop up that screen again for you guys so you can um, make note of those uh, listed uh, contacts. All right, thanks so much, Jen. Uh, we do have some questions from our viewers tonight. So the first question is, um, not too sure how serious this one is, but the person is asking, if I want to be a baby bird mama, do I have to chew the worms and spit them into their mouths? <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully we've learned by the end of today's program that we could never be the baby bird's mama. And that uh, is something that the baby bird's real mama would have to do. Uh, we do not do that. So no. <laughs> Good question though. All right, our next question. Uh, do all animals breastfeed? Mammals do, right? So mammals produce milk and so that's the nurse, um, but other ones do not, right? So it's just mammals that do. 
All right, and our next question uh, is about the Bear Sanctuary in Manitoba. Um, do you know whereabouts that is located? I actually don't know where it's located, um, but they do have uh, Bear Rescue Manitoba. They have a website you can check out. Um, but if you do, again, have any like bear concerns, it's very important to just make sure that you do contact Manitoba Conservation because they work in conjunction with the Bear Rescue. All right, and one more question here. Um, how do you not uh, get stunk by a skunk if you do handle them? You're gonna, it, it happens. This is another reason not to handle wild, you know, skunks, or all skunks are wild, or not to handle skunks at all, because they're, they're gonna stink. They have, they have, you know, their natural musk. Um, and you just, I, you know, in my mind, it was worth it to just take care of them, to move them to a safe location so they could go and live and rather than starve in a hole. <laughs> All right, uh, Chelsea would like to know, what happens if animals roll in poison ivy? Well, in the wild, animals don't get affected like poison ivy like we do. So if a wild animal is rolling in poison ivy, it, it's nothing to them, they just carry on. However, this is a very good thing to think in, uh, in regards to your pets. So if you have dogs and you like to go for walks and you allow your dog to walk through poison ivy, that will actually get on the fur of your dog and then you can then have that transfer onto yourself and then you can get poison ivy from your dog's fur. So something to keep in mind when you're coming out enjoying uh, provincial parks this summer. All right, another question. How can you tell the difference between a baby duckling and a baby gosling? They look so similar. Sometimes they do, um, but generally goslings are gonna be larger, um, kind of like overall. And ducklings tend to be like more yellow and small. Um, but, you know, goslings and ducklings, they kind of have the same thing where if you, it's okay if you can't 100% identify them, you can contact a wildlife rehab center there and they're going to walk you through, you know, keeping like what they think that you're looking at. So you can describe it to them and they'll be like, okay, that sounds like a gosling or that sounds like a duckling. So it's okay if you can't 100% tell them apart. But in my mind, the ducklings are generally like little smaller, kind of like they tend to be more, you know, yellow little guys and the goslings kind of have that more grayish fluff to them. So to me, they look different, but I could see getting confused. But it, honestly, it's OK, because if you can't tell them apart, they have similar um, steps to um, keeping an eye on them in case you think that they're orphaned. All right. Um, Kenza would like to know, are some baby animals predators to other ones? Well, yeah, like any animal that's being, you know, like think of like birds of prey, like raptors. Um, they're going to learn how to hunt and kill because they're, they are predators. That's what a bird of prey is. So they're going to learn how to hunt and kill from their, their, their parents. Um, so they're going to be predators to try and, you know, hunt and kill. And if you think about it, even songbirds go and hunt and kill like bugs and insects and worms and all that. So yeah. All right. Uh, Susan would like to know, can a baby squirrel be placed back in its nest or does the human scent make the mom not return? Um, I believe with the squirrels that you can move them. Um, I don't believe they're born without scent? That's a good question, actually. I don't know that one off the top of my head. I would double check just to be sure. Um, but I know that sometimes a, a good indicator of a squirrel that is orphaned is one that actually comes to humans. So keep that in mind as well. So if you have a squirrel that's actually like a little squirrel that's coming at you and is like actually trying to come towards you, then generally that's not normal. So you want to keep an eye out and see if you do see a mother. Um, I would always just make sure that, you know, you're wearing gloves, regardless if you were to do that. So that way you're not in case you get bit or, in, you know, just protecting from claws and scratches. And just in case of that reason, wear gloves just to be safe um, if you're going to then put that squirrel back. All right. Uh, what would happen if two birds were fighting and a baby bird got hit and fell out of the nest? Well, then that's when you would go to those steps of is it a nestling or is it a fledgling? And if it's a nestling, then you want to put that guy back up in the nest, right? All right. Val would like to know, will ducklings mix in with gosling families? No, no, they are separate. And um, 
goslings will be able they will be able to kind of join in with other goslings of the same size so um, sometimes you can see um, geese are like super mamas and they have like big huge little kind of like taking all the babies in the area so sometimes you can easily like just pop in here's a couple extra orphans and you can pop them in with the rest of the goslings whereas like ducklings are very um, picky and they want their own ducklings so you could not um you couldn't take a gosling and pop it in with a duckling or take a duckling and pop it in with a gosling they have to be with their own um so especially with ducklings you want to make sure you you call a wildlife rehab if you're really worried about um, an orphan duckling because they're they're harder to rehome whereas the goslings are like Meh, whatever i've got 20 kids i'll take two more so all right and that's all the questions we have for tonight <laughs> great well thank you guys so much i'm going to pop up on the screen here that uh, contact information. So that way you guys can write down that. Um, otherwise, thank you guys so much for coming. We hope to see you guys out here in parks in this beautiful summer. Um, stay safe and thank you guys so much for coming. <laughs>